back in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Made it down to verse 3. We've been talking about the characteristics that you would look for in a bishop or a pastor. And we've talked about how this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler. So... I think we made it to that not a brawler. So yeah, when it comes to being not a brawler, it's, you know, no striker was somebody with, that was quick to violence. You know, you don't want to be a striker. And then you don't want to be a brawler. That's like fighting with words, you know, like a brawling woman, like it talks about in Proverbs 21.9. Look at Proverbs 21, 9 real quick. Proverbs 21 and verse 9. It says, It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a white house. A brawling woman is a woman that is just always running her mouth. And you can fight with your words just as much as you can fight with your hands. If somebody's a brawler, I mean, it's just they're not making for themselves a good testimony. Proverbs twenty five twenty four says the same thing. It says, It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman and in a white house. I know this is talking about a woman, but... You know, a man shouldn't be a brawler either, just always going around picking fights with people. And then uh, Titus 3, 2, it says to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. You got some guys that go around and they're just constantly picking fights with people, verbal fights, with their words. It's like they just want to, just put somebody down constantly, constantly just criticizing somebody, constantly have to critique everything they do and, you know, saying fighting words. So patient, not a brawler. Those are good characteristics. Patient, not a brawler. Then it says not covetous. Now, I'm sure you probably have an idea of what covetous means. And I think this is a big one that uh, plagues a lot of pastors. So it says covetous. You don't want to be covetous. Let's look at some verses regarding covetousness. Exodus 20 and verse 17. All the way back in the Old Testament, Exodus 20 and verse 17. In Exodus 20 and verse 17, it says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So you don't want to be pretty much you don't want to be discontent you want to be happy with what god's given you and be so happy with what god's given you that when you look at your neighbor's stuff and somebody else's stuff you don't just want all their stuff be content with such things as you have what's something that gets uh, pastors into compromising the message is covetousness because you can't get all this stuff that all these other or that all these mega church pastors have without compromising the message uh, they see the flashy stuff they want that they see the big houses the nice cars 
the big bank accounts. They see all that stuff, they start coveting it, and then they'll compromise the message so that they can get more money coming in. You shouldn't be covetous. Be content with your bank account, your money, your car, your house, your congregation. Just be content with what you've got. Let's look at some New Testament verses that will go along with this. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6. All the way into the New Testament, the book we're studying, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6. It says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. So you see that? With what you've got, the clothes on your back, the shoes on your feet, the food in your fridge, just be content with it. Godliness, living a godly life, and being content with what you have, you're going to be the happiest person in the world. Don't go around having to covet everything. Let's look at another one. Hebrews 13. Five. Hebrews 13 5 once again the Apostle Paul talking I believe the Apostle Paul was very content with the things that he had in Hebrews 13 5 he says let your conversation be without here's our word covetousness and be content with such things as ye have for he has said I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so let your conversation, your not just the way you talk, but your manner of life, the way you live, be without covetousness. You don't need everything that you see. And you'll find that as you can get something, a couple months later, you're already tired of it. The newness wears off, and you're wanting something else. Philippians 4, look at Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Once again, Paul talking, he's learned a valuable thing in life, and that's just to be content with the things that he's got. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned, and whatsoever state I am, Therewith to be content. I, bo I know both how to be abased, and I know how to be how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I could do all things through Christ which strengthen, strengtheneth me. So he's learned whatsoever state he's in, therewith to be content. If you're on the side of the road, if your car's on the side of the road, and you can't get it started, you might as well just say, hey, I've still got breath in my lungs, still got the Bible, I've still got my family, I've still got all these things, and just be content with the situation. If you are in the greatest moment of your life, you need to just be happy with that. Just be content with it. And... Enjoy the moment that you're in. Don't want more and more and more. Just be content with whatever the situation brings. So, don't be covetous. That's a good character trait of somebody that you would look for in a pastor. Don't be covetous. And once again, it's a good character trait for you to have as a Christian. Alright, back to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we've made it to verse 4. First Timothy 3 and verse 4. It says, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So, one that ruleth well his own house. And a lot of people want to use this verse here to say that if a man's been divorced, 
then he cannot be a pastor. But that's not true. That's not what it says. And r ruling your house well can actually lead to divorce. Divorce doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't rule your house well. It could mean that you did because you got some people who maybe they were they got married when they were lost and their spat, their wife never got saved. Then when they get saved, when the man gets saved and he starts trying to live for God and starts trying to clean his house up, the wife doesn't like it and she leaves. So because he was ruling well his own house, it led to the divorce. It led to her leaving. And that wasn't his fault. He was trying to live right. And she says, I can't live like this. I don't want to live like this. I want to continue living a sinful lifestyle like we were doing. And she says, okay, I'm leaving. So ruling well your own house does not... Um, it, that could lead to divorce... So ruling well your own house does not does not disqualify a man that's divorced necessarily. So one that ruleth well his own house. And this is a big one. Because he needs to show people how to behave in the house of God. And you see that down in uh, verse 5. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And then it says in verse 15, in the same chapter, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So, if he rules well his own house, that shows he's going to easily, more easily be able to take care of the house of God. So he needs to, Verse 4, he needs to rule his own house, not someone else's. Think about that for a minute. He, he doesn't, you know, usurp the authority over the husbands in the congregation. You know, the, the individual husbands in there are the head of their own wives, not the pastor. He's, he's ruling over the house of God not over each individual house because the husband is the head of the wife not the pastor but he's showing a good example about how to rule his own house now let's look at some verses colossians 3:20 colossians 3:20 or 319, or let's see, 318. It says, Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. You see, a good household has the, has the woman in submission to the husband. And if he's constantly having to yell at her and scare her into doing what he says, then it's not actual submission. You know, the, the wife has to take part in this too. She has to willingly respect her husband enough to submit. Now, if he's living a good life, not being a hypocrite, doing what he's supposed to do, trying to live godly, trying to live by the Bible, and she rebels against that, that I don't believe that means he's not ruling his own house well. That means that his wife is rebellious. And it says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. If the husband is loving his wife and doing what he's supposed to do by her, providing for, being a man getting up and, and going to work every day, providing for her, then he's loving his wife, trying to lead her spiritually, trying to give her the Bible. You know, he's loving his wife, doing what he can for her. Then it says, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Once again, if the children won't submit to the authority of the woman and the man, then the children are rebellious. It's not necessarily the parents' fault. You know, you see some kids out that's acting up and stuff, 
Everybody wants to look at them and judge them and say, well, the parent, it's the parent's fault. The parents aren't disciplining. The parents aren't doing what needs to be done. And maybe that's true sometimes, but it's not always true. There are plenty of, of uh, examples where the parents are constantly trying to do what's right by the kids, constantly got them in church, constantly trying to teach them the Bible, constantly sitting them down, having talks with them, uh, spanking them when they have to, giving them talks and punishments and taking things away, grounding them. You know, I, I know people, even myself, where I've, there's been times where I've tried everything in the, in the book to try to get my kids to mind, they still rebel. And uh, I've always looked back and thought about why is God having me go through this with my kids? Maybe it's all, it, it'll leave me to be long-suffering and patient with people and their kids. You know, you got all these people that want to go around and judge you and say, you need to discipline your kids more. You need to spank them harder. I mean, you can only spank a kid so hard until, you know, it's too hard. It comes down to people have a free will choice. The wife has a free will choice to submit to her husband. If her husband is being godly, trying to lead the house in the right way, and she does not submit to that, she is rebellious. If the children do not submit to godly parents, they are rebellious. And the problem is with them. The problem is with the wife. If the, if the wife's trying to lead a good life and the husband refuses to lead the home spiritually, the problem is with the husband. You know, each member of the family has their role, and but at the same time, they have their own free will choice. Each one, the wife, the husband, the children, all of them, they have a free will choice to do what God says or not do what God says. We can't make each other do what God says no matter what you do. You could take away everything your kids got. You could get on them every day, 24 hours a day that you're with them. You could spank them a thousand times. You could have them in every church service. You could take them to every Bible school going on all summer. If they want to rebel, if that's their choice, that's what they're going to do. You, can't, you, you really can't make anybody do anything. You can make their life miserable while they do everything they want. But when it comes right down to it, they have to choose to submit to you. And if uh, you're having to beat your kids just to respect you, really they don't respect you. If, if uh, you're constantly just having to beat them to respect you, and, and I don't, when I say beat, I mean, you know, the type of whooping you're supposed to give, you know, on their bottom, not abuse. I mean, if you're constantly having to just yell and scream and and threaten and put fear in people, they're rebellious and they really don't respect you. They're really not submitting to you. And you know, people just always want to judge. They always want to stare. You know, I've I've seen it with not just myself but with other people. You'll be out in a restaurant. Maybe their kids are acting up. And everybody around is acting like, oh, they're so much better than the people with the kids because the kids are acting up, maybe causing a big scene. And they're just, they just sit there and stare, especially the older generations. It's like the older generation, maybe their kids are grown up. Maybe they don't see their grandkids much. And so when they're out in a restaurant and they see some kids acting up, they will literally just sit and stare at you and your kids the whole time and you can basically see them saying why don't they discipline those children why don't they do this why don't they do that and you're just constantly being judged by these uh, especially that that older generation they just want to look at you and judge you they another thing is they don't realize it's not like it used to be it's not, it's not like it was when I was a kid anymore. Uh, and the Bible talks about it. 
Paul talks about to Timothy, one of the last day's signs is children will be disobedient to parents. That's just the way it is. If they're not, then oh, you're missing that last day's sign. Uh, children are disobedient to parents. That's a last day's sign. Maybe you're doing everything right. Maybe you're trying your hardest to live for God. Maybe you're trying your hardest to discipline your kids. Don't get discouraged. Don't let this, especially the older generation, they're going to look at you, they're going to judge you, and say, well, my kids didn't act that way. I got my kid up and I beat their tail. You're not spanking them hard enough. All this stuff. They're not realizing that we're living in different times and they don't know what's going on in your house. Obviously, you're not going to pick the kid up and spank him as hard as you can right there in the middle of Texas Roadhouse or wherever you're at and cause a big scene. You know, people's going to judge you everywhere you go. Don't let them get you so discouraged that, like, these, these older crowd, a lot of times, will get you so discouraged you don't even want to take your kid to church. And they, they will discourage you out of even leaving your house because you just you get so ashamed of, of uh, how your kids act in public. <clears throat> Don't let them discourage you and um, just keep trying. That's all you can do is keep trying. Keep praying. Keep trying to lead your family right. Keep trying to lead your kids right. And... Most likely they'll grow out of it. And then all that word you put in them, just keep trying to put the word in them. The only thing that's going to fight the rebellion of your kids and, and your wife, if you are a, a husband, is just keep putting the word in them. More times than not, it's the wife that's living right and it's the husband that doesn't care about being the spiritual leader of the home. So as the wife, just continue to keep trying to uh, live a good life in front of your husband and you can win him over just like Peter talks about he the the husband can be won over by the chaste conversation her manner of life he he can be won over by her by the wife's manner of life you see just keep trying that's all you can do you're going to have all these people around you constantly staring constantly judging constantly making their little know-it-all comments. You need to discipline more. You need to do this more. You need to do that more. If they had your kids, they may have done put them up for adoption. And just don't put much thought into what they're saying because most of the time they don't know what they're talking about anyway. They forgot what it's like to even have kids and they don't know what it's like to have kids in 2023 they would probably be in worse shape, worse off shape than you are with them. So just overlook them. So one of these characteristics, one that ruleth well his own house, and if you're doing the best you can do, trying to live right, trying to lead your family right, and they don't listen, it's not your fault, it's their fault. I don't see no other way around it. You're trying to do everything you're supposed to do. You're doing everything God wants you to do. And they still will not fit themselves into the biblical roles that God's laid out in the Bible. They had their free will choice. They chose to rebel. So one that ruleth well his own house. Well, what's some examples of somebody who's not ruling well his own house? I think a guy who just gets, he won't even get up out of bed. He won't go to work. He doesn't care nothing about the Bible. He won't uh, get his family in church. He won't have Bible lessons with them at night at home. He won't try to teach them the Bible throughout the day with little ch opportunities that he gets. He does things like uh, every time he sees a good-looking woman, he's got a comment on it in front of his wife. He won't help her do anything. She's got to do everything. That's not ruling well your own house. That's somebody that you would not want as a pastor. Because if he can't even do the th things like that at home, why would you think that he would be able to lead uh, 
the house of God. So you need to have a balanced view of ruleth well his own house. Just because a man's wife is crazy and his kids are rebellious and crazy does not always necessarily mean that he's not ruling well his own house. And this goes just goes along with the next thing. Rule, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Once again, like I said, if the wife and children are just have to be beaten and terrorized, into, if the guy's doing that, just beaten and terrorizing them into submission, is it really submission? Do they, does he really have the rule? It really isn't submission. If you're having to do some things, some harsh things, some evil things to get them to listen, that's not submission. So it says having your children in subjection with all gravity, you know, seriousness, you're serious in how you're, how you're living, sobriety of manners. Having your children in subjection with all gravity. Look at Titus 2.7. Titus 2 and verse 7. And all things showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, you know, being serious about things. You know, you're not taking your parenting as a joke. You got your children in subjection with all gravity. You know, some parents, they're acting more like friends not taking things serious, so therefore everything to the kid is a joke, and they're not in subjection. So, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 4, or verse 5. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So you see, if he can't, do the things that's required to rule his own house what makes you think he's going to be able to take care of the house of God how can he take care of the church of God and remember that church of God that's not talking about a building the church is made up of every born again believer every born again believer on this earth right now makes up the church and then across the world you've got local churches which is made up of born again believers now let's look look at some verses about the church of god real quick to give you a better understanding of what is a church of god it's not a building that you go to like some people they're just they think it's a building and they they think that they leave the presence of God when they leave that building and they enter the presence of God when they get into that building. And the, to the point that they almost become somebody else when they enter that building and then they go back to who they really are when they leave that building. Like some people say, I've heard people say, uh, we're in church, don't be cussing. Well, you shouldn't be cussing no matter where you are. Being in church doesn't have anything to do with it. Or being in that building doesn't have anything, shouldn't have anything to do with it. Because you shouldn't just see that building as like the Old Testament tabernacle or something. You know, as a born again believer, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. You take God everywhere you go. You don't just enter the presence of God when you get into some building. And you don't leave the presence of God when you leave that building. So let's look at some verses about what is the church. Let's look at Ephesians 5.22. Start in Ephesians 5.22. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, 
even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. You see that? Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let, their, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, did he give himself for a building or did he give himself for the people in the building? It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So are men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Now look at this. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So us, as born again believers, we are members of the Lord's body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We make up the body of Christ. That's what the church is. It's the body of Christ. All born again believers. And it says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. You see, we're one with Christ. It says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So this shows you we are the church. All born-again believers make up the church. Not only that, but we make up the bride of Christ. And that's why he compares it to the husband-of-wife relationship. And you could even tie this back in with uh, the man ruling his own house well because, and, you know, the, the perfect, the, I mean, there's no perfect home, but there, God has laid out what would make up the perfect home. And that is with the husband being the spiritual leader, the wife being in subjection, and then the children under the man and the woman. That's the biblical roles there. And when those biblical roles are in line, it ruins this picture here of Christ being the head of the church as the husband is the head of the wife. And see, when you when the wife will not submit to a godly husband, she ruins the picture here. And I don't think God likes you ruining the picture that he laid out here in Ephesians chapter 5. So that's the, that's the church. Let's look at some more things about the church. Another verse... Turn to Colossians 1.18. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. It says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That just said that he is that Jesus Christ is the head of the body, the church. You see, the church, it's not a building. And it's not just local churches, it's the Lord's body. And the Lord's body is made up of us. We are the members of the body. you got some people that think the church is a building. You know, the average Christian, when he thinks of church, he thinks of a building with a steeple. Then you got other guys out there who they think that the church is only local churches. And there are just local churches. But the local church is born-again believers meeting in a certain area. It's still not the building. But you got some guys who just believe in local churches as in, lo as in just congregations everywhere. They don't believe in the church, which is his body. And that there's, see, in the Bible, you got the church, which is his body. But at the same time, you do have local churches too. You have to see both. They're both here. They're both in there. So there is... A church made up of every born-again believer that you can't see. And then you've got local churches everywhere that you can see. You have to remember that. And then another one is Colossians 1.24, which says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. So the church is the Lord's body, 
the Lord's body is made up of many members that save people. Okay, and when you think of local churches, well, what is a local church? A local church is you've got places where born-again believers are meeting. And just like it says in Matthew 18, 24, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So if you've got two or three people, just two or three people meeting together, that makes up a local church right there. It's not the building. It's the people in that building. All right, 1 Timothy 3, 5. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? How shall he take care of all these believers that are meeting together, looking to him to give them something and help them lead a good spiritual life? Let's look at some more verses about this. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. And Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. You see that? Uh, a good shepherd, a good pastor will give his life for the sheep. He would take care of the church of God. He's going to be able to rule well that church and put it before him. In Hebrews thirteen seven, it says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. You see, how can they have the rule over somebody if they are too lazy and, and um, immature to even rule their own house? All right, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 6. It says, Not a novice, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. So not a novice, not a new convert. You know, a new convert, old or young, is, is a novice. Or an old convert, old or young, who hasn't grew or, tra or been trained by the Lord in the book. Compare this with words like rookie and newbie. A novice. You see, it talks about him being lifted up. Novices haven't had as many humbling experiences in their Christian life to show them that they're nothing. And this leads to them being lifted up in pride. And pride is the sin of Lucifer. See, Ezekiel 28. And Isaiah 14 about Lucifer. He got lifted up in pride. He was lifted up because of his beauty. And you got a novice, he can fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Lest he fall into the condemnation of the devil. What got the devil? It was his pride. So not a novice, not a new believer. Not somebody who's not been at it very long. Not somebody who maybe has been saved a long time but never grew and learned the Bible. You don't want them leading you because they can get lifted up in pride and fall into the same condemnation that the devil fell into. Let's look at Proverbs 16, 18. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Proverbs 16, 18, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. If he's got pride, he's going to fall into the same condemnation that the devil fell into. All right, 1 Timothy 3, 7. It says, Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. 
And that means he should have a good testimony among lost people. He shouldn't be known for lying and cussing and stealing and flirting with people's wives at work. He shouldn't be known for doing all this wicked stuff in front of lost people. He needs to have a good report of them which are without. The ones without is the lost people around him. Let's look at some verses in regards to this. Colossians chapter 4. And verse 4, it says, That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. You got people in the workplace that claim to be pastors, and they talk to people like dogs. They're hateful. They're mean. They cuss. They talk down to people. They ruin their testimony. Everybody thinks that they're a joke. And it gives lost people an occasion to blaspheme. It makes lost people think that Christians are a joke when a man that's claiming to be a pastor can't even come in there and act right. Can't even be above everybody else and how he acts so first timothy 3 7 moreover he must have a good report of them which are without lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil so reproach you don't want you don't want reproach for your evil that you're doing you want to be reproached for your good first peter 4 14 in 1 Peter 4 and verse 14, it says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his on this behalf. So if you're going out and like at the workplace or out in the world and you're getting reproached for the name of Christ, that's a good thing. If you're getting reproached for the own evil stuff that you're doing, then you do not have a, one of these good character qualities that a pastor should have. And what is reproach? Reproach is, uh, you know, somebody charging you with a fault. Like you're going and and they're, you're getting reproached, you know, they're saying stuff about you. They're treating you in a certain way in a with shame and with contempt and charging you with a fault and speaking about you harshly. If they're doing that because of evil things that you're going around doing, then you, you don't have the character trait that 1 Timothy 3 is talking about. But if they're, if you're, if they're reproaching you because of your stance as a Christian, then you're doing the right thing. So, you don't want reproach for your evil, but rather for your good. Let's look at another verse regarding this. Hebrews 11.26 Hebrews 11.26 says, Esteeming the reproach of Christ, the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Talking about Moses. A couple of verses earlier it says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to, to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. So if you're going to work and you're not getting involved in all the other wicked stuff they're getting in, and they're talking bad about you and things like that. You're choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the stuff they're talking about. Then you are esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Egypt pictures the world. And if you're esteeming the reproach of Christ as greater riches, you're then the, the reproach of Christ means more to you than the things that the world can give you. And that's a good type of reproach. 
So First Timothy three seven, having a good report of them that are without, which are without, you got a good testimony in front of the lost world, lest he fall into reproach and snare of the devil. Just like in Second Samuel twelve fourteen, David gave occasion for the lost world to blaspheme, and you don't want to do that. Let's look at First Thessalonians four twelve. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 12, it says that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without. Walk honestly toward lost people. Don't let lost people see you as a fake and a liar and a pretender. Because they already believe that Christians are fakes and liars and pretenders. Don't give the lost world a reason to badmouth you. And give them occasion to blaspheme. Don't fall into the snare of the devil by giving the adversary an occasion to speak reproachfully towards you for the evil that you're doing. Now, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8. Now it gets into uh, character traits for the deacons. So I think that now would be a good time to close this one out and then start in 1 Timothy 3.8 next time.